Thank you, Claire. As Claire mentioned, I'm, I'm a biologist. I'm going to tell you a story about history and archaeology and shipwrecks and pirates, but I'm not a historian and I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a biologist who fell into this by accident. This story takes place in Kodiak. Kodiak, there, that's Kodiak now, but a hundred years ago, well, even longer than that, it was a little village uh, without any trees. And I want to point out this building right here is that building right there, which was the original storehouse for the Russian American company built by Alexander Baranov around about 1800. Russians came to Russian America, as it was known then, in the 1700s to hunt sea otters, this furry creature here. And the reason they did that is because its fur was so rich. And they called it the sea beaver because it was the only thing they could compare it to, bubri morsky. And if you think about human hair, that your average Nordic blonde has about 190 hair follicles per square centimeter. That's about the size of your little fingernail. The sea otter has 400,000 hair follicles per square centimeter. Extremely rich fur. And it was very valuable. They were selling them to China for a lot of money. And they hunted them mercilessly using uh, the native crafts, which were by darkas and kayaks. Uh, the native versions had one hole, but the Russians invented the three-hole kayak so they could sit in the middle and make the natives do all the work, paddling and or hunting. And they hunted sea otters virtually to extinction. Now, in 1792, Alexander Baranov settled the town of Kodiak, and a few years later he brought over uh, some Russian priests, ten of them to be exact, most of them didn't last very long in the crude living conditions in Kodiak, but this fellow, Father Herman, did. He thrived there, and by 1808, he was uh, in charge of the Russian Orthodox mission in Kodiak. But he didn't get along with Baranov because Father Herman wanted to teach the natives to read and to write, and Baranov didn't like that because uh, when the natives were educated, they would understand how badly they were being treated and how badly they were being cheated in all the financial transactions. So Father Herman fell out of favor with Baranov, and Father Herman moved to Spruce Island, about 10 miles from Kodiak, and set up a school and an orphanage where he educated uh, native children. And that alone would have made him famous uh, in Alaskan history. But the real reason he's famous is because at one point there was an earthquake and the natives on Spruce Island knew about earthquakes and they knew about tidal waves, although they didn't call them that. Uh, and they were afraid that their village would be washed away. So they asked Father Herman for help from his God. And Father Herman took an icon, a painting, a Russian painting of uh, something, Mary maybe, and took it down to the beach, laid it on the beach, and said the waves will rise no higher than this. And they didn't. So. To the natives, that was a miracle. And in 1970, Father Herman was canonized as the first saint in the Russian Orthodox Church. Eventually, he died, and he was buried on Spruce Island. Even today, there's uh, an annual pilgrimage to Spruce Island. About 100 people come from all over the country and go to Father Herman's church that he built in the woods and hold the celebration for Father Herman. Now, let's go forward to 1849. The California gold rush happened. San Francisco became a boom town, the biggest city on the west coast of the entire American continent. And they had a lot of things, but what they really needed was ice to keep their food cold, their beer cold, their mint juleps, whatever. They got their ice from Boston. It came around Cape Horn. It took four months. And most of it melted. By 1849, the sea otters had been exterminated in Alaska, and there weren't any furs left to hunt, and the Russian American company was going broke. In fact, Russia was sending more money to Russian America to pay for all the retirees and the schools and the hospitals than they were getting back in terms of furs. 
and that's when they began to think about selling it. But the Russians saw an opportunity here, and they started to sell ice to San Francisco at the unheard of price of about $75 a ton. That doesn't seem like much to us now, but that was a lot of money back then. For 20 years, from 1850 to 1870, the most valuable product coming out of Alaska was ice. Not gold, not fish, not sea otter fur, ice. And most of it came from Kodiak. Originally, they cut ice in Sitka, but Sitka didn't make very good ice for some reason. Too warm, too much salt spray. So they began cutting it from a lake in Kodiak. This lake on an island called Woody Island. They dammed the lake, raised the level, built a sawmill, cut a slot through the woods so they could build a flume and they would sluice the ice blocks down to the beach. They actually had horses on the lake drawing saws to cut ice in the middle of winter. The first and only use of horses in Alaska. And in order to ship the ice to San Francisco, they used ships. The ships they had at the time were mostly old Navy ships and they weren't in very good shape. So in 1850, they had a new ship built in Germany in Lübeck in a shipyard there. And it was built specifically for the ice trade. So it has special equipment on it, including ice elevators. They brought that ship around Cape Horn to Alaska and this is not it. This is the Charles W. Morgan, uh, a whaling ship out of New Bedford that's now at Mystic Seaport. But this is, we think, essentially identical to the Kodiak. It was a three-masted bark. A bark is a ship with three masts, square rigged on the first two masts, the foremast and the main mast. The mizzen mast had what's called uh, fore and aft sails. That, uh, this kind of a ship was easier to sail than a full rig ship and was the most common type of merchant ship on the seas around 1850. We don't know how big the Kodiak was, but we think it was about 132 feet long and maybe 28 feet wide. Um, the shipyards in those days did not make drawings of the ships they built. The master shipbuilders built these ships from memory, if you can imagine that. Later on, people made drawings of how the ships were built, but there are no records of how the Kodiak was built. In fact, there was a Russian grad student, Jenya Anachenko, who now works at the museum in Sitka. Uh, she went to research the origin of the Kodiak, and she went to the shipyard, and they had no, no drawings of it at all. So the Kodiak came to Kodiak. It was named for Kodiak. That was the Russian version of Kodiak. And it shipped ice to San Francisco for about eight years. In 1859, the Kodiak was under command of Captain Ilarion Archimandridov. Archimandridov was a Creole. His father was a Russian. His mother was a native from Unalaska. And he grew up in Alaska. He went to St. Petersburg to uh, the Maritime Academy there, learned to be a ship captain, became famous in Alaska for uh, saving another ship uh, that was dismasted in a storm. And he was very well known. Now, in 1860, Captain Archimandridov came to Kodiak with the Kodiak to pick up a shipload of ice. There it is. <laughs> I know my Photoshop technique is not very good. But he came to Woody Island. This is Woody Island right here. And he loaded the ship up at this very location with 400 tons of ice. And he set sail from Kodiak. He went literally out around the corner of the island, about three miles, and he hit a rock that was not seen above the water. In fact, he'd sailed in this location many times. He'd never seen that rock. But he hit a rock at full sail, all the sails up, and it's, it, it cracked the ship wide open, splintered the ship. Boards were creaking and groaning and straining. The ship heeled over. Uh, the men quickly furled the sails. They tried to save the ship but it was sinking. They couldn't save the ship. So they all got off. Nobody was killed. Everybody got off the ship in rowboats, and there was nothing they could do. They couldn't tow the ship. They couldn't salvage it with a rowboat. So they just watched, and it didn't sink because it's full of ice. It's a wooden-hulled iceberg, and it just floated for four days and drifted with the wind. Now, I'm going to show you the track of the Kodiak on its last 
voyage. Here it is, down here in Kodiak. And it sets sail, it goes out around Woody Island, off of Long Island, and hits a rock and crashes. But it doesn't sink. It drifts for four days, a lot slower than that. And it finally runs aground at Spruce Island. Now, the place it ran aground is right here, Icon Bay. You've heard that term before. Prior to this trip to Kodiak, Arkhamandridov had had dinner in Sitka with the Russian governor uh, of Russian America, Vovodsky, and his wife. And Mrs. Vovodsky, who was a devout Russian Orthodox uh, woman, asked Captain Arkhamandridov, she said, when you go to Kodiak, would you please go to Spruce Island and hold a service for Father Herman, who had died in 1837. And Archimandridoff, wanting to stay in good favor of the company, uh, said yes, he would do that. Now, that would have required him to sail all the way over here, do his business over here, hold the, hold the service for Father Herman, come back to Kodiak. That's probably a day trip. Well, he didn't do it for whatever reason. Maybe he forgot, maybe he was too busy, Maybe he thought, I'm the captain of a ship and she's just some doting matron and I don't have time to do this nonsense. He left Kodiak, ship hits the rock, drifts for four days, finally runs aground and sinks in Icon Bay right in front of Father Herman's grave. And when it did so, there's Icon Bay. This is a, not Father Herman's church, it's a new church. When the ship sank, it left the mast sticking out of the water, forming the Russian Orthodox cross. Now, that story is just too good to be true. I first heard it when I came to Kodiak in the mid-80s, sort of through the rumor mill, and I thought, that, that's a great story, but it's just not possible. Around about 1990, an acquaintance of mine in Anchorage named Mike Yarborough um, sent me some information that he had found. Three months after the sinking, Captain Archimandridov was re requested to chart the coastline of Spruce Island and a Fognac Island. He was a great navigator and a great cartographer, and he paddled around Spruce Island and a Fognac Island in one of those three-person bidarkies, taking bearings with a compass to various points on land and writing them down in a journal as he went. And on about day three, he took a bearing and he wrote, on this bearing lies the mast of the Kadiak. It was still standing three months later. Mike Yarborough found these, the captain's log. Uh, what, what happened to the captain's log? Well, he, he took these notes, he gave it to the Russian American company, who knows what they did with it. When Russian America was sold to the United States in 1867, and now we call it Alaska, all of the property of the Russian American Company came with it, including the captain's logs and a bunch of other paperwork, and they all went into some government warehouse, who knows where. Mike Yarborough found this document, had it translated to English, and sent it to me around 1990. And I read it, and I, I thought, this, this is very interesting. It's a bunch of notes taken by a captain with a bunch of different bearings, and he says he saw the Kadiak. Maybe we can use it to find the Kadiak. But it didn't make a lot of sense to me. The bearings that he wrote just didn't make any sense. And I'm going to sort of share them with you. When I look at a compass, and when a modern navigator looks at a compass, you read the bearing, it says like 250 degrees or 35 degrees or whatever. Archimand Redov didn't record his bearings like that. And of course, they didn't have GPS then. But one of his first bearings he took from a place on Spruce Island called South Point. We still call it South Point, so it's easy to find. And he said, on this bearing, southwest five degrees is the right cape of Manashka Bay. Well, what the heck does that mean, southwest five degrees? That's not something that we normally would use. There could be multiple interpretations of that. I know it's somewhere in this southwest quadrant, but it could be you know, southwest plus five degrees, or it could be five degrees south of west, or it could be five degrees west of south. There's probably more interpretations of this. I had to make some assumptions about what this meant, and I assumed 
that the third one of these was correct, that it meant, I assumed that the cardinal direction would be south and then west five degrees. So that would be 185 degrees, but that's magnetic. And I assume that he didn't have a true corrected compass. I assume he's reading magnetic. So I have to correct it somehow if I want to know what it means. How do you do that? Well, everywhere on the Earth, a magnetic compass does not point true north unless you're at the North Pole. It's always, it deviates to some degree. In Kodiak, the deviation is about 19 and a half degrees now, but it changes over time. What was it then? And how am I going to find out? So I made some assumptions. The first was that this meant 185 degrees, five degrees west of south, that the course was magnetic, and that if I corrected it using magnetic deviation, I would know what the true course meant. So I drew his line on a map, southwest five degrees from south point, there it is. He said it points to the right cape of Monashka Bay, which is here. It obviously doesn't, but if we swing it over, to the right cape of Monashka Bay, the difference is 22 degrees. Therefore, that must have been magnetic deviation at the time. Now, let's apply that to some other bearings. The next bearing he took was southeast, 40 degrees. What does that mean? Well, let's go south, and then let's go east, 40 degrees. That would be 140 degrees. Let's add the 22 degrees magnetic deviation and see where it goes. It points here to a place we call Spruce Cape. But Archimandridov said this is a bearing to Mis Melnichny, which is Mill Cape in Russian, or Miller Point. But Miller Point, whoops, let's go forward. Miller Point is over here. So when I drew these bearings, these are the first two bearings of 30 bearings that I have to solve as he moves around before he draws a bearing to the Kadiak. I, if I can't get these right, uh, nothing else is gonna be right. So I have to get these bearings right. Why is he telling, why is he writing that he's taking a bearing to Miller Point when he's actually taking a bearing to Spruce Cape? I couldn't resolve that. It's not that far off, it's about eight degrees off. This is a th distance of about three miles I thought maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he didn't know which cape he was looking at. Maybe the Bidarka was rocking around and he couldn't take a very good compass bearing. I drew lines on maps for about 10 years and I could not solve this puzzle. Meantime, I started uh, contacting uh, other people and writing grant proposals and <clears throat> nothing came of that. I'm not an archeologist. I couldn't get money to do archeology. span but I did meet Dave McMahon, who was the state archaeologist for the Department of Natural Resources, and he put me in contact with some archaeologists at East Carolina University in North Carolina. Why there? Well, they run a maritime studies program, and they had done a lot of work on shipwrecks, and most recently, in the late 90s, they had found the Queen Anne's Revenge, which was Blackbeard's pirate ship, which was sunk in Beaufort Inlet. And I actually went there to see what they had found, the large cannons that they had in a warehouse where they were preserving them. And we talked about writing a proposal together to get some grant money to do this. So I'm a scientist, and to do research, you have to have money. You need a boat, you need some food, you need fuel, you need to pay people to get out there and do it. It's not cheap. So we wrote a grant proposal uh, in 2003, and we, we didn't get any money. So we were thinking about uh, rewriting it, and at that point in time, I decided I really needed to get serious. If I didn't know where the ship was, I, I wasn't going to be able to convince anybody. And unless I know what the problem is with this bearing, I'm not going to be able to know where the ship is. At that point, I went to talk to um, an archaeologist in Kodiak named Patrick Saltonstall, and he said, if you really want to know about Russian history and and Kodiak in that time, you need to go talk to Lydia Black. Lydia Black was an anthropologist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She wrote a book published around 2007, I think, called Russians in America. It's really a great history of the Russian colonization of America. She was just finishing the book at that time. I told her, I, I went to see her, and I told her, um, oh, but before I did that, I'm getting the story out of sequence. Patrick said, 
Lydia knows more about Russian history in America than anybody else. And she's totally adamant about her knowledge. It may not be right, but don't tell her that. So I called up Lydia on the phone, and I was a little afraid of her, actually, because I'd spoken to her before, and she'd kind of dismissed me as a dilettante. I, and I told her, I'm looking for the Cadillac. And she asked me why, and I said, well, I, I have you know, the captain's notes. I, and she said, oh, well, it didn't sink. They salvaged it. And I thought, oh, my god. I mean, there's no ship. All this work is for nothing. And I said, but, but I have the captain's notes and, and the log. And he took a bearing to the mast, and it's translated from Russian. And that really got her attention. She said, well, you know, wh where did you get those? And I told her. And she knew the people that had provided them to me. So that seemed to pass muster. And she said, well, you should come see me. So I went to see her. She lived in Kodiak, and I rang her doorbell, and she opened the door, and here's this little woman. She's 80 years old, and she's got gray hair, and it's kind of going in all directions, and this little apartment, and it's just stuffed to the gills with papers and stuff. And I showed her my notes and my maps, and she looked, and she hemmed, and she hawed, and she said, hmm, that's very interesting. I said, I, I can't resolve the puzzle about Miller Point. Arthur Mandridoff drew a line to Miller Point, and it's not Miller Point, it's Spruce Cape. How could he make a mistake like that? And she said, oh, he wouldn't make such a mistake. He grew up here. He sailed here all his life. Let me show you. And on her kitchen table was a big stack of papers, like just a mountain of stuff. And she reached in in the middle, and she pulled out this manila envelope, just like a stack of Jenga blocks. The whole thing is kind of wavering. And she pulls it out. She opens it up. And inside this envelope is a map. This is a map she got from the Russian Naval Archives the year before. And it turned out to be a map drawn by Captain Archimand Ridoff in 1848, 12 years before the Cadillac sank. Here is his chart. She said, he wouldn't make such a mistake. Let me show you. Here's Mill Cape Mis Melnichny, right here, where he said it was. That's Russian script, and I could just barely read it, and I looked at it, and it says, Mis Melnichny, Mill Cape. And the hair stood up on my neck. A little light bulb went on over my head. As I look at that, I see him drawing a line to this cape and calling it Mill Point, and sure enough, there it is on his map labeled Miller Point, Mis Melnichny. But that's not what we call it today. We call it Spruce Cape. We call this point Miller Point. So that sort of explained how he could draw his bearing there and call it Mill Cape. Why do we call it Spruce Cape? Well, this map was used as the basis for the, there's Mill Point, the Tebenkov Atlas, which was published a year later by Admiral Tebenkov, who was the chief admiral of the Russian Navy there. And he pulled together charts drawn by all the navigators in the fleet and published the first atlas of the Alaskan coastline. You can buy a copy of this. I had a copy of this in my office that I had bought a year or so before and didn't realize really what the value was. But when I looked at it, what I saw was there's Mies Melnichny in 1849. In 1848, it was here. When this map was published in 1849, it had been moved. And that's what we now call Miller Point. This cape that Arthur Mandridoff called Mill Point had been renamed Mis Elevoy Spruce Cape. And that's what we know it as now. That solved the puzzle. Why his name for Miller Point didn't match the name we know it. And that meant that my interpretation of his bearings was correct. Now I could follow the remaining 30 bearings and map out where he was when he took a bearing to the mast of the Cadillac, I think, where I knew he was. And I literally drew a line on the map, drew an X, and I said, this is the spot, but how are we going to get there? One day I was walking down the street, and I met a friend who was my daughter's sixth grade teacher. I told him this story. He said, I have a boat, and I'm a diver. Let's go find it, just like that. So three weeks later, we went to Spruce Island. Oh, just 
emphasizing Mill Cape, Miss Ellavoy. And there they are. So we went to Spruce Island and we began diving. And this is the team we put together. We invited all the recreational divers in Kodiak that we knew, the good divers. And uh, not everybody could participate, but the folks who did were uh, myself, um, this is Dave McMahon, the state archaeologist, Josh Lewis owned the boat, Steve Lloyd owned Tidal Wave books in Anchorage. Uh, this is Stephen Quinth, who is a filmmaker, and he's written a book about Kadiak and done films about the big bears, and his uh, assistant, Ola. Uh, and this lady is Stacy Beckland, who was the director of the Kodiak Brana Museum at the time. We went over there and we started looking around. There had been a big storm the day before, and the water was all stirred up, and the visibility was just terrible. But I dropped a buoy in the water, literally, there it is, and we started diving. And, and we didn't see anything because the visibility was just terrible. I could put my hand on the bottom and I couldn't see it. We're diving in 60, 70 feet of water. It's 50 degrees. We're diving in dry suits. Late in the day, things started to clear up and we started to find things. Now, on the way to Spruce, to Spruce Island, Dave McMahon told us about the Abandoned Shipwrecks Act, which is an act passed by Congress in 1988. And it says, Abandoned shipwrecks were uh, assumed by the federal government to be federal property if they're within you know, the jurisdiction of the United States. And if they're within state lands, they are turned over to the state if they meet certain criteria. And those are the wreck has to be historic. It has to be uh, in navigable waters. It has to be on state submerged lands within three miles of shore. And it has to be embedded in the seafloor. The Cadillac meets all those criteria. Check, 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 and check. Everybody knew this before we got in the water. One of the things we did, oh, there's Icon Bay from an airplane. The wreck is right about there. So we were diving, and, and we didn't find it on the first few dives. So we had, Steve Lloyd brought a magnetometer, which is a little rocket shaped thing you tow behind the boat and it's connected to this meter and it beeps if it detects metal. It's beep, beep, like that. We towed it around and we got some beeps on it. So we thought, all right, let's move the boat over about 100 yards and let's look in this spot. And immediately we started finding pieces of metal. At first, just little pieces of copper. By the end of the day, we came up with this item here and we don't know what it is. It's a metal strap of some sort with two metal rods. Steve Lloyd brought it up. I think it's probably um, what's called a chain plate, which is a strap on the side of the ship to which they attach the shrouds that hold the mast in place. But we don't know because Steve committed a cardinal sin in archaeology, which was he picked up this item without recording where it was. We don't know where it came from. And Dave McMahon said, well, okay, I'm going to take possession of it because I'm representing the state. When we get back to Kodiak, give me the pieces. So we went back to Kodiak that day, and we were feeling pretty good. We found something. We found some metal, but what is it? Is it junk? Is it stuff somebody's thrown over? Is it a piece of a ship? We don't know. We went back the next day. We started finding more artifacts. We found an anchor. We found a cannon. We found, and the cannon was really exciting, and, and we swam over, somebody swam over it and saw it, and they came back to the boat, and we all went out to see it, and we couldn't find it again. Because we didn't really know where we were, and the visibility wasn't that great. But by the end of the day, we had seen what we think is an anchor winch, a cannon, um, some piles of machinery, a pile of ballast stones, uh, and, and an, at least two anchors. So we knew we were onto something. It looked like a shipwreck, possibly a wooden shipwreck. Was it the Cadillac? We didn't know. I went out. Oh, there's the artifacts we brought back. Notice there's something missing here. One of these rods is missing. Those are the artifacts that were turned over to Dave McMahon at the end of the day. And Dave came to me and said, you know, I, I know there were two rods there originally, but he, Steve didn't give me the other one, so I'm a little concerned about it. But I'm not going to get too upset. He probably just forgot. I went back two days later with some other divers. The water had cleared up, and I mapped the entire site, literally just swimming along, 
estimating distances, taking navigational bearings, and I saw this ballast pile. Uh, we saw a cannon. This is one of my uh, friends, Bill Donaldson, who worked for the Department of Fish and Game. And there's, there's the cannon. That's the muzzle. That's the breech. This is little nub. It's called the trunnion. That's the thing that the cannon rotates on. And we mapped the site. I made a map of it. Literally, uh, this is most of the large major artifacts. A large anchor, uh, hollow tube, that is the anchor winch, a small anchor, uh, a davit, a cannon, large pieces of metal, which might be part of the elevator for raising ice, uh, various other items, and I was really excited. I was pretty sure we'd found the Cadillac by then. I, I bundled up all this information. I sent it off to uh, the East Carolina team, and they were excited about it, and we finished off a new grant proposal, submitted it to the government, and within a few months, we had obtained two grants, one from the National Science Foundation and one from the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration. And we began to plan uh, a research expedition for 2004. By the way, I assumed by following Archimedov's bearing, Archimandridov's bearings, that he was standing on a little rock here to take his bearing, and he took his bearing to the Cadillac and that it was here. That was my estimated position. Where we found those artifacts was about 100 yards west, so I wasn't very far off. I think actually Archimandridov was standing on this little islet because when we got out there and looked, this is a rock that just is barely above water at high tide. Uh, so I don't think he was standing there. And if I'd plotted that line from here, it probably would have gone right through the site. Okay, 2004, we have some money now. And we bring the archeology span team up to do a survey. And when I say a survey, what I mean is we're gonna find, again, all the major artifacts and run, we're gonna run a 200 yard uh, tape measure down the center of the wreck site and measure the location of everything to that. So we have every piece triangulated to a central baseline, and we can tell where everything is in relation to everything else. That was what most of the work involved. This is Dave McMahon. Here we are diving in, in Icon Bay, and this is, who knows who this is, but I think it's Jinya Anachenko, the Russian graduate student who was working on the project. Here's one of the anchors. These photos were taken by Tani Casserly, who was a NOAA diver and photographer uh, who came on the project to be the project photographer while everybody else was working. So you can see a tape measure here going off in some distance. And this is a, I don't know what this anchor weighs, probably three tons, it's very heavy. We did not try to recover any of these big items because they were just too big. Another picture of the anchor. Here's the ballast pile. Now, I showed you a previous version of the ballast pile and there was a bunch of gravel under it. When we came back in 2004, what do you see here? Straight lines. Those are the timbers of the ship, the actual hull planks. They were not exposed when we first found the wreck. They were covered by sand and gravel, but winter storms had washed that gravel away and we could actually see the planks. The archeologists spent a lot of time just lying on the seafloor in 80 feet of water and 50 degrees temperature, just measuring and drawing these planks. They gave me a job. Uh, uh, here's Jason Rogers and myself, and he's doing the work, and I'm just standing by and shivering. Jason would give me what he called the dumb end of the tape, the zero mark, and say, hold it, hold it there, and he would go off and measure things. So I, I stood by and was his dive buddy and shivered while he did the archaeology work. After about a week of this, they felt confident enough in my abilities to do some things. So they gave me jobs, go measure the cannon, go measure the anchor, take another diver with you and, and measure all these points. Now, I had led the team that found the shipwreck, but when it came to writing the grant proposals, the professional archeologists did that. The money went to them. I was just a volunteer diver at that point. I, my role turned over from finder to helper. So I'm just sort of along for the ride now. 
Here's another cannon we found. This is the anchor winch. It's a large hollow tube, and it was, uh, it's about three feet in diameter. It had uh, a wooden core at one time. It has large lengths of anchor chain. The day after we found the wreck in 2003, we were all pretty excited. And my goal was to get all the principals together that had helped to find it and hold a news conference with the dive team and Mike Yarborough and Lydia Black. The day after we found the wreck, an article came out in the Anchorage Daily News saying Steve Lloyd found the wreck site. Steve had sent them the article saying he found the wreck. No mention of me whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he'd found it. It was his project. And, and if I was there at all, I was just along for the ride. Uh, that was quite upsetting, primarily because A, he didn't mention anybody else that contributed to the project. B, it came out in the Anchorage Daily News instead of Kodiak. And C, I did contribute something to this project, I think. And he didn't acknowledge any of that. And, and this really puzzled me. I didn't understand this. Um, it turned out that Steve had kept a piece of the wreck. He kept one of those copper rods. And over the next six months, before we actually brought in the archaeologists, he and his partner, Josh Lewis, had tried to file a private salvage claim on the wreck. They wanted to turn it into a private dive site. They came to Kodiak and tried to convince the public that it would, it would be better for Kodiak if they brought divers in as tourists to spend money in the hotels than to have a bunch of egghead scientists lock this thing up by studying it. And we went round and round on that for about six months. Finally, the attorney general got involved, threatened to send the state troopers to Steve's house if he didn't turn over the artifacts, which he finally did. That allowed us to get on with this research project. So uh, just a few of the other artifacts. This is a boat davit. Uh, we saw two of these in 2003. We could only find one of them again in 2004. The other one disappeared under the sand. We poked and prodded the sand for hours and never found it again. I know it's a boat davit because on the Charles W. Morgan, there's an identical item. There it is. And we also found this item. We actually swam over this item. I swam over this with Frank Cantellis the first day of the archaeology dives in 2004. We looked at it. We kind of looked at each other. We thought, well, this is an interesting artifact, but uh, right now we need to map all the big stuff, so we'll come back to this later. Well, four days later, we had finished diving for the day, and we're all tired, and we had a big dinner, and we're in this warm boat. We had a couple of glasses of wine, and we're just starting to fade. And Frank says, you know, I had a look at that mysterious item today, and there's writing on it. In fact, it has the name of the ship on it. And, and I just, I choked on my dinner. I said, that, you, you gotta be kidding. How, how, where does you see it? How do you know that? Is, does it say Kodiak on it? He says, I, well, I'm not sure exactly because I don't read Russian, but it's got Russian lettering on it, K-O-D, some other letters I don't understand. I think it's the name of the ship. Now you have to understand that when archeologists study a wooden shipwreck, there's usually nothing left. Uh, literally, before I ever did this, I'm thinking Pirates of the Caribbean, there's gonna be a big ship with masts and sails and skeletons and fancy hats. Nah, none of that. When a ship like that degrades, if there was the name of the ship painted on it somewhere, that's gone. The Titanic is a steel ship. The name is welded on the bow, but these, Russian, these, these wooden ships, no. They found Blackbeard's ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. They know it's the Queen Anne's Revenge because it's exactly where records say it was sunk. It had big cannons on it and muskets and all the stuff a pirate ship would have on it, but they never found the name of the ship. We found an article that appears to have the name of the ship on it on day one of the diving and recovered it on day four. Well, we made a plan to recover it. So you don't just go out and pick something like this up. It might fall apart in your hands. How do you do it? First thing to do is figure out where it is. There it is, and you can see the letters K-O, that's a delta D, 
Uh, you'll see the others in a minute. First thing to do is measure it. Find out where it is. So take the tape measure down, measure it from three points so we know exactly where it is relative to everything else, and then very carefully pick it up, wrap it in a towel, put it in a bucket, attach a lift bag to it, which is basically an upside down bag you blow air into that lifts it gently to the surface. At the surface, they didn't just pick it up and hand it to somebody, they lowered the ship's crane, put it on a hook, and craned it up to the deck. And there it is. And sure enough, K-O, delta is a D, the backwards R is Ya, K, Kodiak. Now, I looked at that and I said, well, that's not Kodiak, the name of the ship, that's Kodiak. But Jinya Anachenko, the Russian student, said, it's the same in Russian. Kodiak and Kodiak are interchangeable. This last little symbol is, it looks like a little B, is called a yat, and it's a pronunciation symbol that nobody could pronounce. Even the Russians couldn't pronounce it. And they tried to get rid of it in their, uh, in their alphabet for years. It was finally dispensed with over 100 years ago. It hasn't been used since then. So just seeing that thing, she said, this was obviously made in the 1800s because that symbol hasn't been used since then. So here we have an item that's got the name of the ship on it. And this just, it's unheard of. Maybe one in a hundred wooden shipwrecks, they find a naming artifact. We found it on day one and we've recovered it on day four. What is it? We have no idea. The archeologists think this might be the hub of the ship's wheel. What other item would be important enough to have the name of the ship on it? This is the hub of a wheel from another similar ship from a similar time. I don't see a plaque on there anywhere. Whoops, I'm back, and back up. I don't see a plaque on any there anywhere. This little inset picture is something called the gypsy head which is on the end of the anchor winch and it's used to wrap lines around for raising or lowering sails. That to me looks much more like the artifact, but the archeologists were, were much happier to think of it as the ship's wheel, so uh, I let them have their say. Now that artifact is in a museum here. You can go see it in the display case. I just saw it for the first time in 15 years and it looks a little different it's wet, it's reflecting the light, and now it's dried out and preserved. You can see it a little better. We only picked up a few artifacts, and the reason we did that is because we were concerned that the other divers who were trying to claim this as a private site might go back there and pilfer stuff. So we picked up small items that could be preserved easily, only about 10 of them. Uh, here's a few of them. Uh, this is a bracket of some sort. This is a spigot or valve of some sort. I like to think of this sticking into a rum barrel. Uh, this thing here, um, I thought it was an artillery shell at first. There's lots of World War II paraphernalia uh, in Kodiak. And it was just rolling around on the seafloor. And one of the archaeologists spotted it, and he picked it up, and he brought it up to the ship. And he said, this is a bilge pump. And I said, how, how do you know that? It just, it looks like an artillery shell to me. And, and he pulled out a book from his collection and says, Bilge Pumps of the 1850s. <laughs> Who would have a book like that except a, uh, an archaeologist? I said, well, it must have been a big seller. <laughs> you can actually buy it on Amazon. It's number 379 in marine engineering. It's a bilge pump. It's actually... Uh, so the bilge pump, this sat on a base, and a plunger would be in here, and up on top of the deck would be a crank where people would crank this thing up and down. And it would be normally located at the deepest part of the ship, right in front of the mast. Well, we found the base of it embedded in a piece of wood near the ballast pile, which we think then is the center of the ship where the main mast was. And we also found these items, this is a pentel and gudgeon, and the, this is the hinge for the rudder. Uh, if you look at the Charles W. Morgan, the contemporary whale ship, here it is. They'd strap this, this piece with the hole in it on the bottom, and this piece with the pen would be on the rudder, and they would just lower it down in place. 
I have a little 26-foot sailboat, and it has a rudder that has exactly similar items on it. You can put the rudder in it, the pintle sits right in the gudgeon. And these pieces were found intact, still connected to each other. They had not been separated since they were put on the ship 140 years ago, and they're, they're still together in the museum like an old married couple. At the end of the project, we were able to make, I should say we, I, it's actually Frank Cantellus drew this diagram of all the major artifacts showing where they're located relative to each other. This is our baseline. Everything was measured from that. I want you to imagine a ship. Here's the bow. And it goes back like this. And here are the anchors. Here's the anchor winch. Here's a little anchor called a kedge anchor that they might use to just move the boat over a little bit. Here's a cannon. Here's another cannon. Here's some unknown machinery. Here's a boat davit. Here's the ballast pile. This thing here is a brass frame. We called it the bed frame. But I believe it was a frame that was built over a skylight. The ship originally had a cabin on it that was taken off after a few years and replaced with a skylight covered by a, a grate. And I think that's the grate that was on the skylight. Here are the timbers of the wood of the ship. And as we move out in this direction, there were no other pieces of wood showing, but anywhere we'd stick our hand down in the gravel and sand about six inches, we'd find more wood. So there's plenty of wood out there, and I'm sure there's lots of small artifacts that are still buried. A month later, we got one of the big NOAA ships to go in and do a high-resolution uh, multi-beam sonar scan of the bay. And I'm going to blow that part up. Here's the multi-beam sonar scan. This is the ballast pile. This is some of the machinery. This is the anchor winch right there. It's just a little nub. And if we'd seen that without knowing what it was, it's just a bump on the bottom. But that's actually the, the site of the wreck. So what did we learn from this? One thing we learned is about ship construction. How were these ships were built? The Kadiak was the, at the time, was the only Russian colonial ship ever located. It was the oldest known shipwreck site in Alaska and one of the most well documented. We had the documents that led us to the ship. That's the only way it could have been found. It's also the only known example of a 19th century German built bark anywhere in the world that has been found. Um, the oldest known shipwreck has now been superseded by the Neva that was found near Sitka a few years ago by Jinya Anachenko and Jason Rogers and Dave McMahon, the same folks who worked with me on this, on the Kadiak. And so what? Who cares? Why do we bother? Shipwrecks were really common. Alaska is and has been a seafaring nation. Everything was done by water. All the transportation was done by water, and except for airplanes now, a lot of it still is. In the period that the Russians occupied Alaska, they used over 170 sailing vessels, of which about 30% of them sank. That's what these numbers are for here, to remind me. About 30% of them sank. So shipwrecks were very common, but the Kadiak was unique because it was well documented. And it participated in a number of historic voyages and the historic ice trade. We also learned that wrecks can survive a long time in Alaskan waters if they're in the right conditions. The Kadiak was on a gravel bottom. It didn't sink into the mud. It was surrounded by large rock reefs, so it couldn't wash out anywhere. So once it sank, it stayed put. Shipwrecks are submerged cultural history. The ocean is literally a museum. There's lots of things, shipwrecks in the ocean, that can tell us a lot about our history. And it's really important to study and document them. And it's really important to leave them in place and not pick up things until they can be documented. We learned that lesson the hard way. We still don't know where that initial bronze strap came from or what it was because we have no idea how it related to the rest of the ship. And the other thing I learned, especially from the archaeologists, is we need to have community involvement. We invited all of the divers we knew to participate in the dives, even the archaeology dives. We used a lot of volunteers. We only had two divers go bad on us. They tried to steal the shipwreck, but everybody else was involved in it, 
And the reason is to give them a sense of ownership. If we give the divers and the community a sense of ownership, then everybody will want to help protect the wreck. The wreck was nominated for the National List of National Register of Historic Places, and the last dive made in 2004, we planted a little bronze, bronze plaque on the wreck site that stated it was now on the historic register. I have to end this story with a bit of a sad story. The Big Valley, which was our mothership for the expedition, uh, went out to the Bering Sea six months later to go fishing on the opening day of crab season and sank. And it took the crew with it and the captain, Gary Edwards, who was a good friend of mine. One person survived to tell the story. That's chapter 20 in, in the book. It's kind of the book kind of ends on a downer. Um, all of the vessels that we used involved in the Cadillac search met some kind of bad accident. Uh, one boat I took over there with a remotely operated vehicle, which is kind of a camera on a tether that you fly around underwater. Uh, as it was coming out of the bay, we hit a rock and we busted open the keel cooler and flooded the engine and almost sank it. Another boat, uh, Mario and the, the um, Kodiak Harbor Master took some divers over in 2003 and just last month he hit a rock outside of Kodiak and almost sank his boat. I want to read you one little passage here before I finish. After the Kodiak sank, the Russians, it was a great loss to the Russian American company and they were just exasperated at the fact that Arkhamandridov, who was experienced, could sail out of Kodiak and hit a rock in a place he'd sailed many times before. And the, the manager of the Russian American company wrote a letter back to Russia. He said, it's strange that the inhabitants of Kodiak until now did not notice that the water breaks above this rock and some maps even show the channel in this very location. Maybe this rock grew just recently. I think that in our colonial seas there are many such new rocks. If the bigger ships sailed more often, they would show to us where the passage is clear and where it is not. But from such discoveries, let God protect me. Well, I think maybe the rocks that we hit with the Anna D and, and the sea breeze maybe were also rocks that just grew recently as our Russian forebears warned us about. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that um, my version, my part in this story is done, and the archaeological work is pretty much done. We wanted to get some more money to go back and, and conserve more parts of it, but we never could do that, and we've all moved on. And now it could be a recreational dive site. I, I would like to have other divers go there and look at it, and maybe the maps in my book can help them go there and, and see what I saw. And when they do that, they'll see the anchors and the cannons and the windlass. And in their mind's eye, you can see a ship rising out of the sand and forming itself anew. When I dream at night, I still see the Cadillac sailing down the channel with its sails unfurled and the waves lapping at its hull. And in my mind's eye, the Cadillac still sails through the times and the places and the lives of real people that walk the streets of Cadillac. And that's what brings history to life. Thank you. And I would entertain questions if anybody has any. And they would like you to come to the microphone if you have a question. Thank you, what a great talk. Um, my question is, you mentioned that Lydia, when you first went to her, um, said that, that the Kediak wreck had already been discovered. What's the story behind that? What... Patrick Saltonstall told me that she, she had very strong beliefs about her knowledge, but some of it wasn't correct. And the more I talked to her, the more I jogged her memory. I, 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 I paraphrased a lot of that, but there's a conversation that I recorded in the book. As I talked to her about the Cadillac, she kept denying, no, it didn't sink. 
And then I told her I had this records, and she said, oh, yeah, it did sink. And then I said, well, Archimand Rudolph navigated around Spruce Island in this direction. She said, no, he went in the other direction. And I showed her the maps, and then she said, oh, yeah, okay, he went in that direction. The more I told her, the more she agreed with me. It was like, if you give her the right information, <laughs> she could remember it. But it took a lot of prodding. Since St. Herman is, oh, an important part of this whole story. Yes. When you were lost and trying to figure out why those points weren't lining up the way you expected them to line up, those bearings, and did you ever say prayers to St. Herman? St. <laughs> Herman is very much a part of this story. Uh, no, I did not. But the fact that the ship sank in front of his grave led numerous people, particularly the natives, to believe that there had been some divine intervention. And just about an hour ago, I was over at Hearthside Books discussing this story with the uh, district commander of the Coast Guard, Matt Bell, and his wife, Nancy. And she said, oh, well, they probably left port on a Friday. And we're going, oh, you know, you never leave port on a Friday. Fishermen, and, and you just don't do it. It's bad juju. Uh, it's a well-known superstition. You don't leave port on a Friday. We said, well, when, when was April 30, 1860? Get out the phones, and, and in a couple of minutes, we're going, oh, my God, it was a Friday. <laughs> That's not in the book, but in the next edition, I'm going to have to put that in there. <laughs> it was a Friday. There's a lot of spirituality in this story. Uh, when I was trying to decipher the bearings, I thought maybe I could understand them if I saw them from his perspective. So... My family and I kayaked to Spruce Island uh, in 2002 and camped out. And we had some really weird dreams over there. And one of which was I dreamed I was walking on the beach and I saw something sticking out like the ribs of a whale. And a woman came out of the woods and she was speaking to me in some strange language I didn't understand. And then I turned around and whatever it was I was looking at, was it the ribs of a whale or a ship? And it disappeared. And the woman had disappeared. And I didn't know who she was. I told that story to Lydia Black, and she said, that was Mary, Father Herman's assistant, and he was telling you that the wreck is there. So there's something very spiritual about that place. Just shout them out. You don't need to come to the microphone. I know you... I'm. 80 feet, yeah. So I have a question. Why did you leave out all the backstory about the captain? Leave it out? Uh, you mean it, tonight? Yeah. Restate your question. The backstory about the captain. There is backstory about the captain. Um, and I tell a little bit of it in the book. He got into trouble. Is that what you're talking about? And... He got into trouble with the church and a married woman. And I started to tell that story. I sent, Gally, I sent initial copies to all of the archaeologists to review, and Jenya Anachenko told me that she had done the research on that story, and she wanted to publish separately, and she didn't want me to include it. But the short version is, he got in trouble with a married woman in Sitka. He was... His punishment was... He had to attend every church service, but he could not go inside the church. He had to stand outside and listen, and he could not sail for seven years. He did not sail for seven years until he got command of the Cadillac. So he was a little rusty, maybe, when he was sailing the Cadillac. So there's a backstory to him. I didn't go into it in detail because she asked me not to. So, and also, he did stop the Kodiak to drop off cargo before oh, going on. Yes. Ground. He could have done a lot of things <laughs> that he didn't do. Any other questions? Yes. How long did the Cadillac run back and forth with ice before it went down? It sounded like it was almost 20 years. It was in operation for uh, 10 years. Well, eight years. 
it, it came around the horn in 1852 and, and went on ice runs for eight years uh, until 1860 when it sank. The ice runs would take about three months total round trip. They'd go from Sitka with, they'd bring some cargo to Kodiak and then they would pick up ice and they'd go down to San Francisco and they'd pick up some cargo there, lumber, beef, whatever, and bring it back. That round trip was about three months. And they would ship about 6,000 tons of ice a year uh, from that little lake in Woody Island. By the way, when the U.S. bought Alaska in 1867, uh, we paid $7.2 million for it. The initial deal was for $7 million, but the ice operations still had contracts, and the Russians wanted an additional $200,000 to, to take that on. So that $200,000 was supposedly to cover the ice operation at Woody Island. Although Dave McMahon, the state archeologist, had another opinion. He thought the extra $200,000 was used to bribe senators to vote for buying Alaska. So, we don't know. Yeah, they were interfering even then, yeah, who knows. Yes. Uh, they had 10 ships about that time in, their, in, their, in the period of the Russian-American company. Uh, and the Kadiak was the newest and the best one of them. But through that 10-year period, they had about 10 ships. The ice trade continued until about 1870 when artificial ice makers were invented. And then the, that was cheaper and easier, and the companies that... Uh, owned the artificial ice makers, eventually bought the Woody Island ice operation. They kept it functional as a backup in case all their machines broke at once, but they never needed to use it after 1870. In fact, there were advertisements placed in Seattle newspapers about how real ice from Kodiak was much better than artificial ice. And if you exchange the word ice for salmon, the same argument you hear now about farm versus wild salmon. Well, the bookstore has copies of the book if you want to buy them. I'm happy to sign a few if you do. And uh, other than that, I thank you for coming.